Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bethel this morning. I'm going to ask if you will stand and join us as we open our service with nothing but the blood. good to have you with us as we gather together to worship the Lord. Hopefully that uh, as you sing, you will sing from deep in your heart with joy as we remember all that our God has done for us. The sad thing is, in far too many churches, there are far too many people who when it comes time to singing, they mumble the word. And they're not singing for joy. You take those same people out to the football stadium or the NASCAR race, and they are shouting at the top of their lungs. But 
One question we had, and I'm not asking you to shout, but to say, when you think about what you're singing about, the idea that we were condemned because of our sin, eternally separated from God, and God redeemed us. What does it mean to redeem? To buy back, uh, to buy out of the slave market of sin. God doesn't redeem us by paying a ransom to Satan. A lot of people come up with crazy ideas. But the ransom is paid to the holiness of God. God's wrath on our sin is satisfied because Jesus paid the price. He paid the ransom for our sin. He, be, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when we think of all that our God has done for us, that should cause us to sing from full and joyful hearts. So I hope that every time you sing, you won't be thinking about what you're having for lunch. You'll focus on what you're singing, and you will sing from the depths of your heart with joy to the Lord. It is good to have you with us. Hopefully on the way in you picked up a worship folder. A lot of things in there. I'm not going to read through that today. You can read through that today. Uh, But one of the things that uh, we all know, won't it be wonderful in two more days to have an end to all the political commercials? (laughs) Uh, Thank the Lord for that. And I am sure that no matter who wins the election, we're going to hear about content contesting the election, but at least we won't have all these commercials. Thankfully, I have not gotten, I've only gotten like two or three robocalls the whole, the whole time. Uh, they're not as bad as they used to be. It used to be I constantly would get eight or nine a day, but those commercials are never ending. And, and they're never talking about, I'm the candidate, here's what I want to do. It's always, my opponent is horrible. <laughs> and they're always just blasting the opponent. Uh, but hopefully, if you are a citizen in this nation, hopefully you are registered to vote, and hopefully you will vote if you have not already done so. Regardless of who you vote for, if we would look around the sanctuary, I'm sure we'd say, they're not going to vote the same way I'm going to vote. <laughs> it's okay, it's your brother or sister in Christ, you can love them anyways. But regardless We all want to follow the leading of our God. And we also understand that regardless of who you vote for, God can still put in power the one he wants, and God can still control the direction of our country. But we do want to pause and pray this morning, especially about the election. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, it is so good to, as we meet together, to acknowledge your presence with us. And Lord, as we uh, think about all you've done for us in providing us salvation, providing us hope of eternal life with you, enjoying your presence forever, we are excited. And we say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, even like John in the book of Revelation. But until you come, Lord, we want to be faithful in serving you. And we want to be faithful in praising your name, because throughout this past week, you have helped us every day. And we could talk for hours of all the help you've done Uh, all the ways you've answered prayers. You are so good to your people. And to be able to call ourselves children of the Most High God is such a privilege. We don't deserve it. We can never earn it. But in your love, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And we celebrate your great salvation today. Lord, we also understand that you are in control of this earth. You tell us in Psalm 2, the kings of the the earth take their stand, and yet you have declared, I will install my Holy One in Zion. We look forward to the day when Jesus returns and sets up his throne in Jerusalem, and we find a thousand years of peace on the earth. But until that day, Lord, you have given us secular governments you tell us in romans 13 that we are to submit ourselves to the government but we're also told to pray for our leaders and so lord today we do pause to pray for president biden and vice president harris we pray for 
our governors and our senators and representatives locally for our mayors and council members, all those in government over us, Lord, we pray that they would be guided by your Holy Spirit. We pray that they would make wise and godly decisions. And even when they may have evil hearts that want to do the opposite, may you control them and direct them so that our nation may be blessed. And we pray this week with the elections. Lord, there's been so much focus in our nation. And Lord, we understand that we do not need to turn to fear or worry or anxiety. And we understand that regardless of who is elected, we can rest secure because you are still God. You are still in control. We are still your children. And we trust in you. And so, Lord, we reaffirm our trust in you today. And we look forward to the way you will accomplish your will because we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope praying for your leaders will be a regular part of your prayer lives. And uh, remember, we'll talk more about prayer today a little bit in the sermon, but uh, prayer is not just something we do before bed at night or before meals, but prayer is our sharing our hearts and talking to God throughout the day. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Say, you mean I've got to be on my knees praying for 24 hours a day? No. Uh, it's wonderful to set aside chunks of time to pray, but anytime a need pops to your mind, a thought, a concern, pause and just pray right away. Uh, anytime you have a praise, just offer a quick prayer of praise. Anytime you need wisdom to know what to do, what am I going to do about this? I better pray about it. And pause for prayer. Throughout our day, we want to be people of prayer, those who turn to the Lord in prayer. Would you please stand and join us while we sing, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. you have your Bibles, you can join me in turning in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Old Testament. And we'll get there in just a couple minutes. But first of all, I want to give us a visual image to consider. If you've never been to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., I highly recommend going there, taking a trip and seeing all there is to see. Truth is, you ne never will see all there is to see. You could spend a couple weeks there uh, and not see everything. I forget, it's, they have like 15 or 16 different museums all as part of the Smithsonian. But... One highlight for me as a boy 
was going to the National Air and Space Museum, where you go into this theater. It's one of the original IMAX theaters in the U.S. And their original movie they started out with when they opened that museum was called To Fly. And you're sitting here in the auditorium, and you see then the, the screen starts projecting an image. And it is showing you know, somebody who's getting ready to go up in the air in a hot air balloon, and they're uh, getting ready to ascend, and they're coming up near the church steeple, and you see this little image. And then all of a sudden, the screen blows up to 10 times the size of what you'd been seeing. And you realize you've only been seeing this little picture. You thought that was the movie. And suddenly you see so much more. There is so much more to take in. Uh, I love th that experience. And it just, it is staggering. But today, we want to think about worship. And the little box that we think about when we talk about worship is typically, number one, what we do on Sunday morning here in church. And we specifically think about our singing. Well, worship, well, do, how do you worship? Do you sing hymns or choruses? And uh, we think, well, do you use a piano or an organ? Or, you know, I know her churches use a guitar. And that little box is what we think about when it comes to worship. But we want to expand our perspective this morning when we think about worship. So first of all, think about this. What type of instruments should we use when we worship the Lord? There's some churches in town that say, none. <laughs> we don't use instruments. God doesn't want us to use instruments. But there again, we have to say, well, what does the Scripture teach us? Consider Psalm 150, which says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heaven. Praise Him with a blast of the ram's horn. Play, praise Him with the lyre and harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Or consider Psalm 85. Sing your praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Somehow when we go through the Bible, we get the idea that God likes instruments in our worship, not just a piano or an organ, but literally a whole symphony orchestra, all these different instruments we can use. And I don't think these verses mean that we have to use those specific instruments, but it's the idea that God is pleased when we use a whole variety of instruments in our worship. Because whatever instrument you can play, you can use that in praising the Lord. Whether you play the flute, or I play the clarinet, or I play the saxophone, or I play the drum, we can use any instrument to praise the Lord. They're tools. But I want us now to do the same thing and expand our thoughts a little more about the concept of worship. There's all these instruments we can use when we worship, but there are all these different ways that we can worship. So what does it mean for us to worship? How do we worship our God? Literally, the word worth, worship comes from the old English worth-ship where we express to God his worth to us. We tell the Lord how precious he is, how meaningful he is to us. And so there is so much more to worship than just singing hymns or choruses on a Sunday morning. And to help us think about what worship looks like, that brings us to Deuteronomy 6. 
This morning, uh, we want to read the first few verses in Deuteronomy 6. I'm reading out of the New International Version. If you have a different translation, the words may be just a little bit different, but the same ideas will be there. <coughs> Verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So as the Jews are coming into the promised land, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyard and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Let's pray. Father, these are great reminders for us. We never want to forget you. We never want to forget to praise your name. And we never want to forget to follow you and to give you the worship that you deserve. Help us this morning as we think about a variety of ways that we worship. Help us to uh, expand our horizons and to think about all the different ways that we can worship you. Teach us by your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this passage, Moses gives instruction about worshiping God. And as we can see in this passage, worship is something far greater than just coming to a church service. Rather, it's something that we are to be doing all day, every day. Uh, whether we're lying down at nighttime, walking down the road, going to the store, going to the bowl and I, whatever we're doing, worship is a key part of our lives. And one of the key ideas we see here in this passage is that we worship God by revering Him by offering him reverence. Here in Deuteronomy 6, we are told three times to fear the Lord. But that means more than just being afraid. And the New Testament and the Old Testament go hand in hand, and it's always good to compare the two together. We compare Scripture to Scripture. In Matthew 4.10, when Jesus quotes this passage... Instead of using the word fear, Jesus uses the word worship. He's being tempted by Satan. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So to fear God is to worship God, to have reverence and respect for our God. It's not just the idea of being afraid, but it is a reverential fear, an awe of God. Hebrews 12, 28 tells us, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. That's a verse we'll look at in a couple weeks uh, in more depth. But one of the key ideas is that we worship God by revering him. 
It's sad, but as a nation, as a people, as a church, it's so easy to lose our respect and reverence of our God. People talk about the big man upstairs, and we have such disregard and disrespect for our God. When we went through the Lord's Prayer, remember the first thing we learned, where it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or as the New Living Translation says, Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be honored. If we really want to worship, it begins with a proper reverence for our God. So when we come to worship, Let's understand it's not just an action of standing, sitting, opening, reading the Bible, singing a song. It's the attitude of our hearts having proper respect and reverence. Remember the story that Jesus tells about two men who went up to the temple to pray? The first, a Pharisee, boasted about all the good things he was doing for God. The second man, a tax collector, a man despised by his community, says he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what does Jesus say about the tax collector? I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. When we revere God, we humble ourselves before him. We understand that he is God. He is the one in charge. And we exist to do his will. He's not a genie in a lamp who's just there to answer all of our requests. But to truly worship, we begin by showing a proper reverence for our God. Then a second truth about worship is we worship God by praying to him. Prayer is really an admission of our need of God in our lives. It's a plea for his mercy and grace. It's worshiping him for who he is, for his character, his nature, his works. And as we talked about when we went through the Lord's Prayer, so many times we view prayer simply as a, uh, a wish list. God give me this, God do this, God give me this. How much of our prayer life is about us and how much is about God instead of just talking to God about all the things we want which is a part of prayer but it's a much smaller part rather when we pray we need to acknowledge God and praise him for who he is and what he has done giving him thanks for the help he has given giving him praise for his great salvation sharing about all the things that we see God doing in our world. So we affirm who God is through our prayers. And so we need to make sure that when we pray, we pray with a proper perspective. That's how Jesus taught us to pray, by starting out, honoring and acknowledging and revering God. But then a third way we pray I'm sorry, a third way we worship is by regularly reading the Bible. You say, well, you know, that's not worship, that's Bible study, that's discipleship. But consider what John 4.24 has to say. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So we put our our spirit into our whole hearts into worship. When we come to worship, we're not just mouthing the words, but we're singing with joy from our hearts. But we also worship in truth. We normally don't think about worshiping God in truth. How can we ever worship God without a clear understanding of who he is? To truly worship God, we need to understand the truth about God. And there are far too many churches who are worshiping their made-up ideas, and it's not about truth, 
They say things they think, well, I, I just think that God wants us to such and so. No, where do we find the truth? The Word of God. How do we know the truth? By reading, by studying the Word of God. If we want to worship God for who He is, we need to find out what He is like, what He says about Himself in His Word. Now, if you are married, think back to the days when you were dating. If you're single, think about people you know who've been dating. And your boyfriend or girlfriend gives you a letter. They tell about the things that happened to them during the day or during the week. And while you're glad to hear about what happened, what you're most excited about is that person. The idea that they took the time to express their love. When we read through the Bible, it can be easy to focus just on the facts, just on the things we see. Oh, they won, the Israelites won the battle over the Philistines. But let's never miss the truth of the love of God displayed for us through the Scriptures. Whenever we read a passage of Scripture, ask the question, what does this passage teach me about God? Or how do I see the qualities of God displayed? How does God come through for His people? Scripture tells us a couple different places that all the things written back in the days of the Old Testament were written as examples for us to teach us to help us to learn. So, when you read a passage like Deuteronomy 6, don't just say, well, what did God say the Jews had to do? Instead, think about all the things that that passage teaches us. It teaches us that God wants us to learn. It teaches us that God's laws are given to us for good. Uh, we see that God wants us to have a long, rich life. We see that God keeps his promises. God provides blessing for us far beyond what we get for ourselves we call that grace god's unmerited favor so many things that we learn about god reading through his word so when you come and read the word don't just read it for facts or information read it as part of worship we learn about god and we worship god in response to reading his word now we worship by reading the Bible. But not, by, but not just reading the daily bread. The daily bread is inspiring, but it's not inspired. And it's good to read the daily bread, but don't just read the daily bread. Or don't just read a David Jeremiah book or a Max Lucado book. Read the Bible, because that's this is the inspired Word of God. Then a fourth way we worship God, we worship God by obeying Him, by doing what He calls us to do. If we don't obey God, we are not worshiping God. Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? If we're going to say, Jesus is my Lord, that means he's the boss. He's the one in charge. I need to do what he says. John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. If you say, oh yes, I love the Lord, then we need to obey the Lord. It would be ridiculous for me to say to Rhonda, oh, I love you so much, honey, while I'm living with another woman. She'd say, you don't love me or you would leave that other woman. You would be faithful to me. And in the same way, if we tell God, oh, God, I love you so much, God says, show it, prove it, obey me, do what I call you to do. If we are going to call ourselves followers of the Most High God, then we need to live an obedient life. It doesn't matter how loud we sing or how many notes we take or how much money we put in an offering plate. 
God wants obedience. He wants us to worship him by obeying him. Think about the story of King Saul, 1 Samuel 15. The Jews want a king, and Samuel says, God, what are we going to do? They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Give him a king. So Samuel anoints Saul to be the king. And King, uh, king Saul is to go out and fight against the Amalekites. So in 1 Samuel 15, here is Samuel's message. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? When Samuel came and met Saul, Saul had all this plunder. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best what, of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the, Lord, the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed or hearken or obey is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. We often think about worshiping the Lord by giving, but God says, I would much rather have you obey me than just putting money in an offering plate. In fact, there are times in the Old Testament prophets, God says, don't even bother bringing your tithes and offerings. Stop bringing them. They're detestable to me. Why? Because the people were not obeying. They were disobeying God. So if we want to worship God, we need to obey God. And that causes us each to take some time for personal reflection. Not time to look around and point fingers at other people. Oh, so-and-so's not obeying. No, we look at our hearts, we look at ourselves, and we say, am I obeying God? Am I doing the things that God wants me to do? Then the next way we worship, we've already mentioned it, is by giving. Giving the, back the first portion to God. If you want to know what's really important to you, look at how you spend your money. The Bible teaches us this important le lesson. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6. That which we worship, we will spend our time and money on. And so as you do a little reflection on how you've spent your time and your money, can you say you have worshipped God? The Jews in the Old Testament had a problem. God calls them to give back the first portion of all we get to worship him. Yet they were choosing to keep it back, to use it for themselves. And as a result, they couldn't figure out why they had so many bills and why they were getting behind and why they didn't have any money left at the end of the month. The Old Testament book of Haggai, an obscure book, one of my favorites in the Old Testament, though. God says, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. If you find that you never have enough money, you always have too many bills, maybe we need to pause and ask the question, have I been honoring God with the first portion? Far too many times we look at the bills coming due and we think, well, I need all this money. No, it's not our money to begin with, it's God's. We're stewards. He entrusts us into our care. We get to use God's money. And God says, now of this money I'm giving you, you take the first portion, you give it back, as an act of worship. If you haven't honored God by giving back the first portion, here's what God says. 
you're a thief. Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. God says we live under a curse when we rob God and fail to give back the first portion to him in worship. Now, this isn't about being legalistic, but rather it's about a right heart attitude. When God has our hearts, he'll have our checkbooks, he'll have our wallets, we'll give freely. But when we have hard hearts, we hold on tightly. Some people say, well, pastor, you know, we're, you know, we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. That was an Old Testament idea. If that's what you think, then consider the New Testament. Luke 4. Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect the justice and love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So yes, we need to show love and mercy, but we also need to give that tithe, that first portion, back to honor God. So once again, as we think about worship, do a self-inventory, self-reflection. Have you been giving faithfully to honor God? Not have you pulled out a couple bucks and put in a token gift. But have you considered all that God has provided for you and given back the first portion to honor him? The word tithe literally is 10%. So if God gave you $100 this week, you give $10. If he blessed you with $1,000, you give $100. If you got an inheritance and you made $50,000, 10% is $5,000. If all you got was $10 means one dollar and here again it's not the idea of the percentage as much as it is a heart a heart that says god has been so good to me i'm going to take the first part of all of that and give it back to worship god to praise god to thank him for how good my god is to me then a sixth way we worship god we worship god by loving others Remember that we worship God by obeying him. So what does he tell us to do? 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother might think, boy, that's not very kind of God. First he calls me a thief, and now he's calling me a liar. Well, God calls it like it is. God has designed us to live in community with other Christians. When God creates Adam, remember he says it's not good for the man to be alone. He creates a companion for Adam. And we bring God pleasure by living in community with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The New Testament uses the word fellowship. Say, two fellows in the same ship. But we don't have fellowship when we want to go in different ways, different directions. We can't be in two different ships. But when I desire to follow God and you desire to follow God, we can go in the same direction. We have fellowship. We work together, we serve together, we grow together, we are blessed together. Now, when we think about loving our brothers and sisters, remember that there are different words for love in the Bible. And one of those words, uh, philos, like the, the city Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, is a, a brotherly love, for love for brothers. And then there's agape, the love of God for us. That deep, deep committed love. But what's interesting is in this passage, 
Whoever loves God must also love his brother. It doesn't use the word philos for brotherly love. It uses agape. We need to have a deep, committed love for our brothers and sisters. It's not optional. It's commanded by God, and we need to obey. It's one of the ways we worship. Then we worship by sharing our faith. Psalm 96, 2. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. God wants every one of us to worship him. Not because he's an egomaniac who needs our praise, but because he has designed us with a capacity for worship. We are designed to worship God. And it is as we declare his praises that we truly worship. This psalm says we worship by proclaiming his salvation. God has given us the privilege of sharing with others the great truth of his salvation. Let's realize how others are saved. Romans 10, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. That's wonderful. Good news. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? As we share the good news of the gospel with others, they also can respond and receive God's great salvation. We worship God by sharing our faith. Then uh, two more to go. We worship God by serving others. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. So when we serve others, we really are serving Christ. Now, service is not just bringing the plates at a meal. That's one type of service. But really what we're talking about when we're talking about serving others is making ourselves available to meet the needs in a brother or sister's life. And sometimes that can mean a major commitment of time. It's not always convenient. Sometimes it's very inconvenient, but it's necessary. And when we serve others, it really is a form of worshiping God. And then we worship God by surrendering to him. Surrender is the heart of worship. Think about this. What are the areas of your life that you have not surrendered to God? Is there anything you're holding back? We say, well, not, I, don't, I can't give up this. I love that so much. God doesn't want 90% of your life or 95% of your life or 99% of your life. He wants complete surrender. Farmer Brown one day was having a birthday and the chicken and the pig got to talking about it. The chicken said, you know, Farmer Brown has been so nice for us. We should do something special for him for his birthday. How about we give him a bacon and egg breakfast? Pig replied, that's easy for you to say. For you, that's just a contribution. But for me, that's total commitment. Far too many Christians want to give a contribution. Well, I went to church on Sunday. I put a gift in the offering plate. God wants total commitment. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. You may be a Christian and say, well, I've been a Christian for the last 30 years. But are there areas of your life you're holding back from God? God wants us to worship him by completely surrendering, being a living sacrifice. 
One of the greatest ways to, to think about this is, is simply to ask God. You pray a prayer and say, God, are there any areas in my life where I've not surrendered yet to you? And just be still and let God speak to your heart. And God will probably tell you something you don't say, oh, not, not that, God. Yes, that. And we need to make sure we have surrendered completely to God. So, we worship to God by revering Him, by praying to Him, by regularly reading the Bible, by obeying Him, by giving back to Him, by loving others, by sharing our faith, by serving others, by surrendering to Him. Numbers of ways we worship. It's not just Sunday morning at 1045. But as you think through those, is there one or two where you say, you know, I need to do a better job at that. I may be really good at this one and this one, but we want to make sure we're good at all of them. We want to be men and women of God who seek to worship Him with all of our hearts. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, that you have given us in your word these reminders to us of what it means for us to worship. And we want to worship with pure and sincere hearts so that you may be praised, so that you may be pleased. Help us, Lord, to have lives of worship and seek to worship you every day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand and join us once more as we close our service this morning? Surely God has been with us today as we've worshipped him, and the wonderful truth is he goes with each one of us as we go our separate ways. Before you leave today, take some time to greet one another. You are dismissed. <laughs>